Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, so today I want to talk to you about the future of technology and why we know exactly where it's going. It's not actually a mystery. We know where AI is going, and we know where technology in our pockets is going. And the reason, um, to give you a little bit of background on who I am, I was a design ethicist at Google, which meant that I was concerned. Imagine you're sitting at Google. You go to work at Google every day. And your job is to say, how do we ethically manipulate two billion people's thoughts? Because no matter what choice we make about how a screen works or a feed works, two billion people have one of these things in their pockets. And when you say we're going to buzz your phone every time you get an email, and we say that's the default choice, now two billion people's pockets are buzzing every single time they get an email. And if we say, let's rank the Facebook news feed by um, whoever clicks or shares the most, then the things that get clicked or shared the most end up buzzing people's pockets. So there's an enormous amount of power in technology companies' hands. And there's this illusion that most people believe that technology is just a neutral tool, right? This is just a tool. It doesn't want anything from us, and it's up to us to choose how we use it, right? That's what people think. I'm here to tell you why that's not true. Because behind this screen, every day, there's hundreds of data scientists, engineers, statisticians, AI specialists who go to work, and they have a goal. When you pick this up, they actually want a very specific thing to happen which is for you to spend as much time on the screen as possible. And they have a whole set of techniques that they use, techniques that I learned um, at a lab at Stanford University called the Persuasive Technology Lab that teaches engineering students how do you hook people's attention. Because the business model of advertising means that there's only obviously so much attention in the world. You have so many hours in a day. And if today I'm Facebook and I have 30 minutes of your day, you multiply that by the advertising rate and you get a stock price. And the problem is there's only so much attention. So if YouTube says, we're going to autoplay the next video, right? You go to YouTube and they, they say, let's try to get people to spend more time. So what we'll do is we'll autoplay the next video. And let's say that causes you to watch a little bit more videos because now the next one just plays. But then that just increased how much time YouTube gets from people. So now Facebook has less time, which means they have to say, let's autoplay every video in the newsfeed. Let's start sending you more emails. Let's do live video. So it becomes this race to figure out how do you get more of people's attention. So instead of offering a product, if I want to hold on to that 30 minutes, I have to crawl deeper down the brainstem and hook you. I have to turn what was a conscious use of a product into an unconscious, addictive use. Because as the attention economy gets more and more competitive, you have to get better and better at addicting people. And a clear example of this, just one example, is Snapchat. If you didn't, how many people here use Snapchat? Yeah, a few, okay. Mostly younger people do. There's, a, there's several hundred million people who use Snapchat, okay? It's the number one way for teenagers in the United States to communicate. So for, if you're between the ages of like 12 and 20 years old, then it's the number one way that you communicate was with Snapchat. And they tried to figure out how can we hook teenagers into using this product as much as possible. So next to every single one of your contacts, they put a number, which is the number of days in a row that you've sent a message back and forth with each person. So what they just did is they gave two people something they don't want to lose. It's like taking two children, putting them on two treadmills. Treadmills are, you know, you run, right? And you tie their legs together, and then you hit start. And they both have to keep running, because if they, don't, if they stop, one of them stops, the other one falls down. And so you have hundreds of millions of teenagers sending messages back and forth that aren't even real communication. 
Because the other part of what I mentioned to you is AI. When you come to conferences like this, you usually hear from inspiring speakers talking about what will happen in the future when we make an AI that outsmarts us, right? And it's, it runs away and it, it does something smarter than all of us. I'm here to tell you that we've actually already built a runaway AI. And instead of it outsmarting us, we actually pointed it at us. Because we actually pointed the most powerful supercomputer. Where are the most powerful supercomputers in the world right now? Where are they? They're inside of Google. Well, sure. They're inside of Google and they're inside of Facebook, right? I mean, is there any other company that has a more powerful supercomputer? Nope. Google, Facebook. And what do they do? They point the supercomputer at your brain. So when you open up a news feed, we think that what we see in the news feed is just what our friends are posting. But before you see what your friends post, Facebook has to choose which friend you're going to see. And how does it choose that? It chooses that by asking, what would be the perfect thing I can show you that will maximize how much time you spend? So every time you open up a news feed, it's playing chess against your mind. Do you remember playing like, chess against the computer back in you know, 10 years ago? For a while, when you played chess against a computer, it's kind of fun, but the, the chess isn't that smart, and so you can kind of beat it, right? And then it gets smarter, and it, start makes, it starts making these moves, and you're like, don't even understand how it made that move. And it feels like it's challenging. And then it beats Garry Kasparov, the world-famous chess player, the best human chess player in the world. And when it beats Garry Kasparov, it's just beaten all of humanity at chess for all time. Because it can see millions more steps ahead on the chessboard than Garry Kasparov or any human can see. And the exact same thing just happened a year and a half ago with the Go game, the Go board, which was never solved by AI and it was just recently solved. It beat the best Go player. So now we have these supercomputers, but instead of playing chess or Go, they're playing against our brain. And democracy is at stake. Because all of these systems, YouTube is an AI trying to figure out what's the next video I can autoplay, the perfect next video. And it's not like it's a, a stupid video or a funny video. It could be a video that you really want to watch. But it's going to get so good at finding out what you really want to watch that you'll never want to sleep. Right? Tinder, dating app. How many people here use Tinder? Probably don't raise your hand. Tinder is an AI trying to figure out what are more perfect reasons I can show you not to be with the person you're already with. It's trying to figure out, of all the faces I could show you, let me show you the perfect next face, the perfect temptation. Cambridge Analytica and the Facebook advertising engine for political ads is an AI trying to figure out, of what political message I could show you, let me test 60,000 variations with varying the different word choices. I'll vary how the politician's face is angled and what their face looks like and what the button should say to find the perfect political message, playing chess against your mind to figure out what will perfectly resonate with you. So the reason that I'm here and that I do the work that I do in the world is because this should feel like an urgent problem to you. Because it's not hypothetical. It's not something that could happen. It's the world that literally exists right now. A few months ago, uh, I actually became one of the um, main sources for the U.S. congressional investigation into the Russian interference in U.S. elections for social media platforms. And a lot of people don't know that, uh, how much really took place there. Because uh, Facebook claimed that, and what you might have heard in the news, is that Russia bought $100,000 in advertisements, which is not that much money. So it only affected a small number of people. But actually, what really happened is that Russia built an entire campaign of 470 fake Facebook groups. Uh, they created groups that were pro-Muslim Americans and anti-Muslim Americans, and created fake Facebook events at the same location where two people, these two groups would show up at the same place. 
They created pro Black Lives Matter, which is a big um, African American movement in the United States, and an anti Black Lives Matter group. They created Texas secession groups to get people to secede from the United States and to celebrate Texas pride and bring their guns to events in Texas. They also tested whether or not they could get people to show up at events by remotely creating events to announce, we're going to give away free food in Times Square. And then they would actually look at the webcams to see whether or not people showed up. And they did. And so if you think about the world that we live in, there's two billion people who use Facebook. Two billion people. That's more, that's about the number of followers of notional, uh, sorry, notional followers of Christianity. Two billion people. 1.5 billion people use YouTube. That's about the number of notional followers of Islam. These products are used every day. We check our phones about 150 times per day. So it's almost as if we're in the matrix. And every morning you wake up and you check your phone, you've got this jack in the back of your brain, and you suddenly have images, text messages, thoughts that you didn't choose. So from the moment you wake up, I can fill your day with a photo of your friends having fun without you. From the moment you wake up, I can fill your day with a political message, right? So we've created this kind of civilization scale mind control machine, except the inmates are running the asylum, and even Facebook can't control what they've created. As a friend of mine likes to say, artificial intelligence is an exponential technology. What are exponential technologies? It means that you can have an exponential amount of impact. You can affect a billion people with a little button. You can push a button and affect a billion people. Whether you can create new CRISPR you know, uh, bacteria or you can create new thoughts in two billion people's minds, exponential technologies let you affect billions of people or exponential amounts of impact with a small amount of work. And what we've created with Facebook is we've, we have the power of gods, the exponential ability to influence people without the wisdom, got, like ethics, or accountability of gods. Because Facebook can't control or know what it's pushing into two billion people's minds. In the United States, we at least have a free press and congressional investigations, and we can talk about misinformation, disinformation, and elections. But right now, in Burma, Facebook uh, basically went overnight in the last two years, becoming the number one way that people in Burma uh, uh, communicate and connect with each other. And they didn't even have the internet like two years ago. And there's now, if you don't know this, the Rohingya genocide, where basically Muslims are crossing over the border in Bangladesh because of fake news that's being spread in Burma about this group, this ethnic group. And for, for each time we talk about the problems with Facebook in the US or in Germany and the elections in France, what we miss is that this is steering thoughts in cultures and languages that the engineers at Facebook don't even speak. There's no way they can control this thing. It's like we've unleashed Pandora's box because there's just too many amounts of impact without that extra amount of guidance, ethics, or sensitivity. So the reason I'm here today is to talk to you about this problem and give you a sense of the structure of the problem. We cannot survive or live in a world in which you have the most powerful supercomputers in the world pointed not at solving climate change, not at solving cancer, but pointed at extracting attention out of human beings. In the same way, that someone who's a coal miner looks at a mountain and says, I don't see, there's, there's these ecologies of life at the mountain and the trees and the birds and the bees and all these things that are supported by this ecosystem. But a coal miner looks at it and says, well, it's just more valuable for me to blow off the top and extract stuff from the mountain. Well, Facebook looks at a human being. They look at you. And instead of seeing you as part of an ecology where you support your friends and you support your family and you support your sleep and you support democracy and you have conversations with people and there's these fabrics of ecologies and interactions that you are embedded and are a part of, technology doesn't see that and it basically points this machine at you and tries to extract as many minutes out of you as possible. 
with increasingly effective techniques. So the only way we can solve this problem is to put the AI on the same side of the table instead of being on the opposite side of the table and have its goals align with our goals. And we can do that by actually saying that, these, that the advertising-based business model is fundamentally misaligned with human values, and we can actually have it be owned by us. Last thing I'll leave you with is when asked, what is, um, what are, we asked nine experts what, what they should do to fix Facebook. And the professor at uh, Columbia University said it should become a, public global, uh, a global public benefit corporation because that's the only way, as crazy as that sounds, to take this machine that we've created and actually have it work for human values. So thank you very much.